Hi, welcome to The Jacobin Show. I'm Ariella Thornhill, and today we are joined by Adolf Reed, author of The South, Jim Crow, and Its Afterlives. Hi, Adolf. Hey, how you doing? Good. Yeah, it's great to see you live. Yeah, this is kind of crazy, but I'm really <laughs> glad that we get to talk about this book in person. because well, well, good, me too. Yeah, yeah, there's so much in the book. I wanted to start by talking about your strategy in grounding your analysis in anecdotes from your own life. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it's, it, it's almost dishonest to call it a strategy, but it is strategic, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I mean, like I've said a number of times, like I just started writing with no goal in mind and not even really an audience. Um, but um, but the, the first version of the text, which was much shorter, combined um, sort of you know, straightforward political and historical account with vignettes um, that basically took, uh, took off from, from moments in my own experience that I thought would be helpful for shining light onto broader cultural, political, economic dynamics. So, so I did that, and, and I think that that's just kind of the way that my mind work, work, works about that sort of stuff anyway, and um, that's, that's frankly one of the things that had drawn me and, and other people like, um, um, like, like, like the Ewans and others, um, some of Aronowitz too, um, to, to the Frankfurt School, is like the idea of sort of finding the logic of capitalism in in cellular examination of facets of everyday life. So. Yeah, I think it's really, really effective in the book because it takes some of the lack of specificity that the contemporary liberal view of Jim Crow has, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like a lot of angry white people and bad feelings right. propping up this system and it complicates yeah. it. And it complicates it in a way that seems very common sense to read it. When you oh, read about these different kinds of community formations and networks, men getting together to work on a car, crossing mm -hmm. the color line to do that, or listen right. to a baseball game together, you start to see that the sort of spectacular narrative that we have of that moment in time was actually a really complicated fabric of different individual calculations about how to conform to a system of segregation right. that was imposed on everyone, white and black alike. Right, absolutely. And like that was the precise um, source of the book, right? But, um, and I mentioned this too, but I have a couple of good, good friends who uh, around the end of the last century, like the three of us often enough round, round robin or all together, would uh, remark on the fact that when our general age cohort was gone, there wouldn't be anybody else around anymore who had that kind of textured understanding, and therefore all, all there would be is this kind of stuff that you just uh, you know, described. And, and, and that not only doesn't you know, make, make sense as a way to understand what the Jim Crow world was, and I mean, who wants to preserve a memory of the Jim Crow world anyway, right? But, it, but it's just a bad way to, to understand history, to understand how we got from there, where, wherever there was, to here, wherever here is. And I mean, a parallel, um, it's, it's probably overstating it to call it frustration, but like every year around Martin Luther King's birthday, right, you know, wherever you're living, you know, somebody from the local TV station is gonna go to the middle school, grade school, high school, and ask kids what, what you know about Martin Luther King. And without regard to race, gender, age, whatever, like they all say some version of, a long time ago people you know, didn't have any freedom and then Martin Luther King came, came and brought him freedom. And when we think about how credentialed people think about um, you know, the history of black Americans in, or, or of black people like in the US, it, it's like, um, it, it, uh, um, a narrative of oppression porn, right? That mm -hmm. begins with slavery, which is just oppression porn. Mm -hmm. and, and then what follows slavery is what's often described as w having been worse than slavery. So like sh sharecropping, Jim Crow, or more um, oppression porn, right? And that doesn't help you understand how we got to where we are, or well, well there's no history like in that history. Mm -hmm. um, 
And another facet of it is that if that um, if what was bad about the past was um, was the sadistic excesses, then that leaves open the possibility that slavery, minus the the sadistic excesses, it wouldn't have been so bad, mm -hmm. right? And to write my son uh, had. Um, what, what once had a student uh, a number of years ago uh, in his African American history class, who, who who was quite confused about um, why planters, you know, didn't want either slaves or sharecroppers to be educated, because the student, black student, who was a business major, said, "Well, but it just seems like if if he'd let them enhance their human capital." then they could have been more productive as workers <laughs> and it would have been better for him. So like, this is the world that we're living in now. Yeah. So anyway, like I know I went, um, what, what my grandmother used to describe as going all around Robin Hood's <laughs> barn, right with that answer, but. No, I think you make a, a really good point there because that lack of specificity is something that you call out several times in the book, mm -hmm. but you call it out on both sides. And I don't think people give you proper shrift for that. Like, you're often portrayed as a kind of critic of the liberal mm -hmm. or progressive left. Right. But you make it very clear that the fiction of what slavery was, the fiction of white supremacy, was a fiction for whites in the South. Mm -hmm. That them propping it up as this enduring system right. that you know started with slavery and lasted and needs to be reclaimed, that fiction was unstable. Right. Jim Crow proved it was unstable. Right. And there's a similar kind of ideological falsehood operating with the liberal fiction about, you know, the oppression porn version mm -hmm. of racism in America. Right. So what do you think is the issue with the liberal side more clearly? The issue with the Republican side, we know, right? right. We don't want right. to prop up the idea that there was a kind of enduring white supremacy on the basis of black inferiority right. and the South will rise again, et cetera. Right. But Afro-pessimism in its current iteration does something similar. It imagines a timelessness to racism. Yeah, I mean, Afro-pessimism is like Madison Grant and Charles Murray dipped in chocolate, right? <laughs> and that's all it is, right? It's the same argument, right? Yeah. That, that, that race drives the world and has always driven the world, even thousands of years before race was invented. Right, race was somehow driving the world, and and like one thought I have about this is, is it well, so like this is first of all like the ideology of people who always get enough to eat because there's a mm -hmm. there's a kind of luxuriation in, um, um, in 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 a romanticized fantasy of suffering, right? Mm -hmm. right, right that we've always suffered, mm -hmm. right? That people who's immediate like material circumstances are not fully pacified, just don't have occasion or interest in indulging, right? So, so I mean, that's one thing. Well, I tell you, like, um, so there's one little scene early in the book that, that I know has caught a number of people's attention. But, you know, when my little cousin uh, from Jersey and I went to, uh, you know, went my grandmother mm -hmm. to the zoo, like... So in that story in the book, just mm -hmm. for our audience who hasn't heard it, you go to the zoo with your cousin and there's a pony ride. Right. I mean, every kid would want to ride a pony. <laughs> and, and, and at that point, we were in like full, like there's a picture someplace of the two of us together in my grandparents' driveway mm -hmm. with me, me with the Dale, uh, the Roy Rogers suit mm -hmm. with my pistol and her with the Dale Evans suit with her pistol. So we were definitely yeah. in full flood. <laughs> wow, I want to, what, I get to ride a pony moment. Right, especially as two big city kids who yep. don't see animals as a rule. So you showed up and then right. it was segregated. Only right. white kids could ride the pony. Right. So until I was an adult, like I thought of this as as as, as an illustration of what a bad person, you know, the guy who wouldn't let us ride mm -hmm. the ponies was. But then as I started to think about it, but like we really don't even have to think of him as somebody who was committed to Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. Right, like he might have been, he might not have been. He might have been somebody who who was committed to keeping his job, yeah. right? Uh, but 
And that gets us to what the liberals, or what the problem is with the way the liberals want to perceive this. Because for them, it's good people and bad people, people with good attitudes and people with bad, bad attitudes. And what they have done consistently right, about race uh, or racial inequality um, is disconnected from political economy. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and that's what their, their deal is. And you said that at the time you felt offended, mm-hmm. you know, and it is humiliating to be denied something. Well, to be honest, I don't see, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, my cousin Gwen may have had like a, well, like a more, I mean, sophisticated sense, but, but I doubt it. Uh, like for me, at least, see, when things like that, that happened, um, yeah, I just cried because I couldn't get to ride the pony. Yeah. Right, and another story in that same part of the book with my grandmother is like the Algiers Ferry, mm-hmm. right? By the way, I love your grandmother. I oh, <laughs> in she was a piece of work. Her. I'm telling you, <laughs> and her, and she had a slogan like "Love many and trust a few, but always paddle your own canoe." Oh, so, uh, yeah. yeah, you got to write these down. That's the next <laughs> book. Well, so the story is you're on the Algiers Ferry, which I've right. written actually with my kids now. Right, yeah, I'm know, sure post you have. Jim Crow, but. Yep. Um, there was a chicken wire fence. Right. And you and your grandmother and your cousin, is that right? Oh, no, just me and my just grandmother. Just you and your grandmother had to yeah. sit behind the fence. Yeah, uh, yeah. somebody asked me a couple of days ago, or last interview, or whatever, whether you know, I was conscious that the people on the other side of the chicken wire were all white. And the fact is that I wasn't. Mm-hmm. Right? It, but, but like, it just didn't register at that point. I was like five or six, and, and, and again, like, yeah, I'm coming into and going out of um, the regime, basically. So, mm-hmm. and so, so part of learning the protocol is learning race difference, mm-hmm. right? And also, and, and I mean, normally for people who who are sort of born into it, it's kind of like being Catholic, right? You're just born into it, and you just sort of know that's who you are, and that's what it is. Mm-hmm. But but it's not even a matter of you know, some claim about not seeing race, whatever that means. But it's true. Like, uh, um, 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 I mean, Barbara Fields used to do this thing in her classes at, at, at Columbia where she'd ask students how many people were sitting next to somebody of the same race. Mm-hmm. And then she'd ask them how many people are sitting next to somebody who, who looks just like you. And her point is that, 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 that there are gazillions of ways that human beings vary Mm-hmm. Phenotypically, right? Uh, and, but uh, but only some of them get picked up uh, to mark something called uh, the quasi-species difference of of race. And our point was always to show that those markers were were determined by political, economic processes and dynamics, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it feels to me like we've lost so much ground, like on all those fronts. I mean. Um, and I'll say this too. I mean, one. So, so I got into um, race as a research area. I mean, like race science, or mm-hmm. you know, race from the standpoint of history of ideologies, because around the turn of the century, around the turn of this century, um, Ward Connerly, who was like a um, a douchebag, black douchebag from South Louisiana, who moved to California and was just a nasty piece of work. He had first sponsored, um, um, I think it was an immigration restriction ballot initiative. And then he came back and did this thing that he called it the California Civil Rights Initiative, which would have prohibited the state from keeping records by, by race, mm-hmm. right? And, but, but I was reading about it one day and learned that he, he had two exceptions for this prohibition. One was criminal justice, and the other was medical research. And I thought, well, you couldn't imagine being more ass backward, right? Mm-hmm. So I determined I was going to write an op-ed piece for one of the California papers. But before I did... What year was this? Uh, this must have been around 99 or 2000, 2001, something like that. But, but before I did, I thought, well, you know, I'll go to the opposition group's website what, to see what position they're taking, because I don't want to you know, get in the way. Mm-hmm. And I was stunned to find out that on the public health button page, whatever, uh, they, the opposition was actually arguing that the CCRI would 
make it impossible to track diseases that only we get, right? mm -hmm. we, we as people of color. So I thought, okay, well, shit, what can I do? Like, I can't write the op-ed piece now. They're also, as I understand it, wrong in, in the way that they're portraying what this bill would do. But, but even if they're right, they're right in a terrible way, right? Mm -hmm. because, because they're opening the door for, for, for the return of racial medicine. And as you know, you've seen this again about the COVID stuff. Yep. And why are people so oblivious to, to the impact of what they're actually doing? So how did it feel to kind of look back at your life after coming to some of these conclusions about race and racial ideology uh, later? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, and, and I'm not sure I have an answer, which may be weird. Uh, <laughs> at one point in the 90s, when this little cluster of us uh, sort of, you know, I don't know, left, black, anti um, essentialist, right, academics, was starting to congeal as a cabal, mm -hmm. right? Um, You're verifying it's a cabal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out it, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, Ken, Ken Warren, who of course like is one of them, uh, and, and we had like a two-man seminar that we did for almost the whole time that I lived in Chicago at Jimmy's Woodlawn Tap right in Hyde Park at the University of Chicago. And we're talking in, in the bar one night, um, um, and it just occurred to us both that most of the people in this circle of ours were either people who, were, who had been raised as you know, military brats mm -hmm. or academic brats. Mm -hmm. And it made sense, because, it, because if you move around a lot, that, then you learn in, intuitively right that the uh, um that 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 the idea of a racial essence is bullshit right? mm -hmm. so and then like for some of us like you stir in that phenotypic mess down down, down in south louisiana and that also kind of predisposes you to understand that this whole whole thing is fake 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 in some way so I don't know. I mean, um, insofar as there was a revelation for me that came, came along uh, or that came through the process of writing, um, it, it was that, that bizarre new, what, I mean, new agey, incoherent uh, sensation that, that I describe in the intro. Mm -hmm. um, what, what was actually going on there? Uh, and it wasn't anything like Brigadoon. It was like, um, the, um, a distinction between a, a way of seeing what were vestiges of, of, of earlier forms of interaction um, as being just that and not as you know, continuations of anything. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.